and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Beloved, if you can grasp what our Lord says in this very parable, you will not only understand the overall thrust of your Bible, but you will understand what we just sang about, namely the grace of God. Let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You be seated. The kingdom of heaven is the holy Christian church on earth. When you confess, just as you did a moment ago, that you believe in the holy Christian church, you are confessing that you have been swept up by the kingdom of heaven and you are a proud member of it. For the kingdom of heaven is wherever Jesus is, wherever he is giving out his gifts in both word and sacrament. And here's what we must keep in mind. The kingdom of heaven does not operate according to our fallen human reason, the way that we expect it to, the way that we anticipate it. Rather, it operates on a completely different set of rules. See, we think the kingdom of heaven should operate on fairness, on earning, and on people getting what they deserve. But the kingdom of heaven does not do that. Though that might be fine elsewhere, Jesus does not deal with us on the basis of fairness. He deals with us on the basis of favor. Jesus does not deal with us on the basis of merit. Jesus deals with us on the basis of mercy. And this is what is called grace. Grace is a disposition of God. It's how he is. Just as we Lutherans refer to law and gospel, we like to say that this is God's accent. It's how he speaks. It's how he talks through both law and gospel. Grace is like that in that it is a disposition of God. Jesus, he likens the kingdom of heaven to a vineyard, to a, with, or to a, a vineyard with a landowner, and then with workers. As you just heard, the workers are called early in the morning, just as the sun is coming up and a full day lie ahead. The workers, those workers, they agree to bear the burden of the full day's work, enduring the heat, and they will be duly compensated. They agree to work for one denarius, and that is an entire day's wage. They are content with this, and they're sent off into the vineyard. But then the landowner goes back to the marketplace three hours later, and he hires some more workers. You know those folks. It took him a little bit longer to get going in the morning. I like to sleep in a little bit, hit the snooze button a bunch of times, drink two cups of coffee as they read the paper. They take their time. But once they make it to the marketplace, they're hired and they're sent out into the vineyard. Three hours later, though, it's lunchtime. And sure enough, there are some who were just getting started. They must be college students. But they want to work too, and the landowner hires them. Surprisingly, the same thing happens early afternoon. It is 3 p.m. And then, wouldn't you know it, at 5 o'clock, guess who gets hired? Some real winners. I mean, real losers with a capital L. They have wasted the entire day. They don't seem to be bothered by it at all. Once they get to the marketplace, all they do is loiter around. Yet surprisingly, the landowner hires them and he ships them out into the vineyard to pick grapes for one hour. For one measly hour. These guys don't even break a sweat. So when it's time to knock off, the whistle blows and everybody lines up to be paid. The latecomers get in line first and those who have worked all day 
And you can tell, sweat soaked. Hands may even be bleeding from the calluses that have formed. You know who they are. They're at the back of the line. They're the ones who worked 12 hours. They worked all day long. The guys in the front only worked one hour. But you, can you believe this? One denarius is flipped in their direction. You gotta be kidding me. I'm an entire day's wage for just one hour? This is incredible. Word would have shot through the line that the terms of the contract it has been changed. I mean, my goodness, if one hour is equal to one denarius, then 12 hours? Carry the one, my God. Wow, what a payday. What a payday. This is wonderful. The men who work three hours, they get up to the table and each one receives one denarius. This is still extremely generous. But then the guys who work six hours get one denarius as well. The guys who work nine hours get the same. And the ones who are up and at them at the crack of dawn, only one denarius is given to them. One. Just like everybody else. Now those workers do exactly what we would have done. How dare this landowner do this? We worked longer, we worked harder, we had seniority. They are outraged at the grace that the landowner shows to those who were hired last. You know, you could say that God went out real early in the morning looking for workers to place in his precious vineyard to tend his beloved church. You even know their names. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, David. There are plenty of others. But out of all the other nations on earth, the Israelites were to be his unique people, and as you know, from whence the Messiah would come. As a nation, they celebrated the Passover. They came out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. As Paul wrote in today's epistle, all of those were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed him, Paul says, and that rock was Christ. The point is, the Israelites started out trusting God, believing they deserved nothing from him, and knowing him to be good and kind and full of mercy. But over time, faith turned into unbelief. And what did the landowner do? The landowner does what the landowner does, and that is what? He goes looking for more workers. More workers to bring into his vineyard even a few Gentiles. Here and there, doing this throughout the Old Testament. Why? Because he wants all to come into his vineyard. All to come into his kingdom. All to experience his outrageous generosity mercy and love. And so what you do is you fast forward to the opening sections there in the New Testament and what do we find Jesus doing? He is mercifully receiving sinners. He is sitting at the tax, or oh, excuse me, sitting at the table with tax collectors. He's talking to prostitutes. He's touching lepers. He's associating with Gentiles. All these people who sat in great darkness who are nothing more than real losers with a capital L. These people hadn't worked very long or hard at keeping the law of Moses. They were inadequate. Yet they're being brought to repentance. 
Jesus would say to them, take heart, your sins are forgiven. And just like that, they receive the same gift of forgiveness. They receive the same gift of Christ's righteousness. They receive the same gifts of eternal life. The workers hired at the outset thinking they could keep all of God's laws perfectly, they should have rejoiced at the mercy of God. They should have loved their fellow man, been glad to be fellow recipients of the generosity of God. Instead, it was just the opposite. They looked at these, these workers coming in late and they thought, equal status in God's kingdom with us? No way. No way. It's not unlike when our Lord is being crucified. As one criminal, as you know, heaps abuses upon Jesus, what does the other criminal say? He says, hey man, stop it. He says, we're getting what we deserve. This man, though, has done nothing wrong. And then he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now this loser has spent his entire life sinning. And after finally getting caught, he's now being executed for his crimes. What does he deserve? Hell? Just like I do. Just like you do. But what does Jesus say to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. Can I tell you something I heard just this past week that was quite fascinating? In Jewish eschatology, meaning just in a purely Jewish understanding of theology regarding the afterlife and heaven and hell and where we go after we die. The general thought was that only those who never died went to paradise, namely Enoch and Elijah. Enoch walked with God, Elijah was taken up in the fiery chariot, and there's no record of their physical death. Only they were considered to be in paradise. And what does Jesus tell this loser? Today, you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> Blows up Jewish eschatology right there. Wow. Did the criminal earn this? Not at all. And with that, Jesus makes the thief on the cross just as equal even to Enoch and Elijah. Wow. You know, to those who scoff the grace of the landowner and they complain about his generosity, those who look at Jesus, as the King James says, with an evil eye, he says, take what is yours and go your way. The kingdom of heaven, the favor of the landowner are no longer accessible to them. Gratefully, they're accessible to you. You are in the kingdom of heaven right now. Why? Because the landowner, Jesus, he found you loitering out in the devil's kingdom, spending all of your time memorizing and reading the devil's catechism. He called you out of darkness into his marvelous light and then he baptized you, which wasn't a work you did, showing everybody else that you're saved, as the American evangelical believes. Your baptism was his work, forgiving you of all of your sins. And this is the gift. This is the exact same gift that God did for the person who was sitting next to you. It's the same baptism that was given to Martin Luther. It's the same baptism, the same gifts that were given to St. Augustine and that which was even given to St. Paul. It's the same gifts from the same generous, good, and kind God. Furthermore, he gives everyone the same favor, the same forgiveness, the same salvation, the same eternal life. You have the same righteousness, the same promises, the same name of God placed upon you, whether it's placed upon you in this divine service or whether you place it upon yourself. 
your prayers are equally heard and you will be equally rewarded on the last day when there is a new heaven and a new earth and you're in a glorified body and you are true humanity the way that God intended. <coughs> Thank you very much. This landowner, he delights to give what is undeserved to everyone. Everyone. He's not fair. He is not fair. But he is generous. And he is good. Jesus then concludes the parable saying what? Many are called. And many are called. But few are chosen. Few remain all the way to quitting time. Yet what does the generous landowner give to strengthen his workers? As the sun blazes down upon his workers? As those who have been in the field for quite some time, it seems that the clock just stands still. What does he give? He gives his word. He gives his absolution. He gives his body and his blood for you to eat and for you to drink, all of which makes your hands strong, giving you a clean heart and renewing a right spirit within you. Praise be to this generous, generous landowner. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Stand together.